On May the 1st, 305, Diocletian's reign came to an end. He voluntarily abdicated with his right arm Maximian. The past 20 years have enabled him to stabilize an empire in severe imbalance. He left behind him a new imperial succession system, the Tetrarchy. The Roman world was now ruled by four tetrarchs. Two of them were elevated to the rank of Augustus upon the abdication of the previous ones, and two new tetrarchs were invested as Caesars. Each Augustus adopted one of the Caesars as its heir and ruled a part of the empire with him, the east for one and the west for the other. The Roman Empire, however, remained only one state, with one of the two Augustus as its official monarch. But, with Diocletian away, the first frictions did not take long to appear. Among those who hoped to be promoted Caesar that day was a certain Constantine. Now in his thirties, he had been part of Diocletian's inner circle in recent years. His father, the now Augustus Constantius, whose health was faltering at the time, asked Galerius to send his son back to him. But he was reluctant and delayed the departure of Constantine. The latter, feeling threatened or simply nourished by resentment, fled on horseback. Taking care to go north of the Alps, he reached his father's territory in summer. Together, they led a victorious campaign against the Picts and the Scots. Later in York, Constantius's poor health ended his life, and his son was immediately proclaimed Augustus by his troops on July the 25th, 306. Galerius, learning of this, did not fully accept it. He only allowed him the rank of Caesar, while elevating Severus to the rank of Augustus. With this compromise, a crisis was avoided. With his position secured, Constantine moved to Trier and led brutal campaigns against the Franks and later against the Alamanni tribe. In Rome, the son of the previous Augustus Maximian, Maxentius, was angered to learn that Constantine had been promoted Caesar while him, possessing greater legitimacy, remained powerless. But he smelled an opportunity when the city was shaken by shocking news. Galerius had indeed decreed that the city of Rome was now to be subject to taxation. The Praetorian Guard, as well as several other central institutions in Rome, rallied behind Maxentius and seized power. Learning this, Maximian returned to power alongside his son. Galerius categorically refused Maxentius's legitimacy and Severus marched against the usurper. But arriving in front of Rome, a large part of his army joined his enemy. The Western Augustus was captured near Ravenna and died shortly after. This time, Galerius intervened himself. Maxentius used the same strategy as before and remained inside the city. In turn, parts of Galerius's army deserted. Seeing his situation weakened, he offered reconciliation, but Maxentius refused. The Augustus had no choice but to fall back and plunder northern Italy along the way. During this same period, Maximian went to Gaul to forge an alliance with Constantine. He recognized him as Augustus, while Constantine married his daughter Fosta and declared his support for Maxentius. Back in Italy, Maximian became jealous of his son regarding power. After an argument with Maxentius, he was kicked out of Rome and took refuge in the court of Constantine. Shortly after, the Vicarius of Africa, Lucius Domitius Alexander, usurped the title of Augustus. In 308, the Tetrarchy was destroyed, as there were now five Augusti and one Caesar. To restore order, a conference was held in November at Carnuntum in the presence of at least three major figures. Galerius and Maximian, 
asked Diocletian to take back power and restore the Tetrarchy, but he outright refused and urged Maximian to abdicate yet again. A new Tetrarchy was proposed, in which Galerius and his Caesar Maximinus retained their current titles, and Constantine was to return to the rank of Caesar. Finally, a new Augustus was to be introduced, Licinius, a friend of Galerius. This proposal was not well received. Constantine refused and Maximinus complained that Licinius was designated Augustus without having been Caesar before. In the end, Galerius gave up and promoted every member of the Tetrarchy. Maximian, clinging to what remained of his prestige, returned to his son-in-law, from whom he obtained hospitality as well as some troops in southern Gaul. But while Constantine was campaigning on the Rhine, Maximian rebelled, failed and committed suicide. Licinius, since 308, remained very cautious and did not really try to take Italy, knowing how the previous attempts were defeated. Maxentius took the opportunity to regain control of Africa. In the east, Galerius, after several years of unsuccessful persecutions, declared Torrewans towards the Christians in April and died of illness. With him, faded away the last pieces of the Tetrarchic authority. Quickly, his neighbors took over his possessions. In the West, relations between Maxentius and Constantine deteriorated rapidly since the death of Maximian, whom his son wanted to avenge. It was time for war. Constantine took the lead, leaving the majority of his men on the Rhine. He crossed the Alps with some 40,000 men, Against all expectations, Constantine inflicted a series of important defeats to the troops of Maxentius, and northern Italy fell into his hands. First, thinking about the same strategy as against Galerius, Maxentius started to prepare for a siege. However, the discontent in Rome, as well as a certain prophecy, pushed him to march against his rival. His army deployed beyond the Tiber, with a hastily constructed bridge. It is said that before the battle, Constantine had a vision of a divine nature, and it was after this that he ordered his soldiers to draw this symbol on their shields, Chi and Rho, the first two letters of Christ in Greek. On October the 28th, 312, took place the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. The two armies began fighting, quickly, Constantine's cavalry routed their opponents and then attacked the infantry. Seeing that the battle turned into a disaster, Maxentius fled and drowned in the Tiber. A large number of his men shared his fate. Shortly afterwards, Constantine entered Rome in triumph and officially declared the dissolution of the Praetorian Guard. He was now emperor of the whole West. At the end of the year, Diocletian, having witnessed the destruction of the system for which he had worked for so many years, died in his palace. Constantine sealed an alliance with Licinius by offering him his sister in marriage, Constantia. Maximinus, who in the meantime continued the persecution, realized that he had to act quickly and cross the Bosphorus. Taken by surprise, Licinius rushed to Thrace, where he defeated his opponent at Cyralum with a much smaller army. After a few other clashes in Anatolia, Maximinus was defeated for good and Licinius became sole ruler of the East. Soon after, he engaged in a purge in which he executed many potential opponents, as well as Diocletian's wife and daughter. Satisfied with his new situation for the time being, Licinius revoked his claims on Italy, accepted a certain preeminence from Constantine, and reigned in the east, notably fighting on the Persian border.
Constantine was a follower of Saul Invictus, just like his father was. However, his religious positions were gradually shifting in favor of Christians, and he was probably thinking that he owed his victory over Maxentius to divine intervention. So, he decided to offer an important place to Christianity. In 313, in accordance with his ally Licinius, he decreed the Edict of Milan. Christians were now free to worship and officially fully recognized as citizens of the empire. Confiscated properties were returned and the church even obtained foundings and other privileges from Constantine. The emperor even intervened in the internal affairs of Christians, especially with regard to Donatism. This direct consequence of the great persecution rallied many supporters in Africa and condemned those who bowed to the Romans during those persecutions. Thus, when Bishop Sicilianus was elected in Carthage, the Bishop Donatus triggered the schism which took his name. The Emperor, acting as an arbitrator, sought to calm the tensions. The Council of Ars later condemned Donatism and its supporters. Despite all these actions, the Emperor took care not to offend the followers of the traditional pagan religion, as there was still the vast majority of the population, it retained an important place. Relations with Licinius ended up deteriorating as the two monarchs went to war in 316. The conflict that followed was indecisive, but Constantine had the advantage. He won at Sibalis, and further battles took place in Thrace. Eventually, an agreement was reached in which Licinius ceded his westernmost territories. By way of reconciliation, the son of Licinius and Constantia was proclaimed Caesar along with the sons of Constantine. While Constantine led battles on the Danube against the Goths, he crossed the border separating the two Augusti. These acts again triggered war. Yet again on the defensive, Licinius receives Constantine's troops near Adrianople. The two armies faced each other, each occupying one of the banks of the Hebrus River. With Constantine's army arguably being smaller, a frontal attack across the river was not an option. However, after a few days, Constantine found a place through which his troops could cross quite easily. He then made Licinius's troops believe that he intended to build a bridge at another place in the river and took the lead of his cavalry to cross to the other side. It was then that he attacked the enemy by surprise. Seeing this attack succeeding, the rest of the army crossed and joined the melee. Soon, Licinius was routed, but Constantine, wounded, did not pursue. Retreating, Licinius crossed the Bosphorus. His fleet also having been defeated by that of Constantine under the command of his son, Crispus. A new bloody battle was waged at Chrysopolis once again won by the Augustus of the West. His adversary took refuge in his capital of Nicomedia and, knowing himself defeated, surrendered to Constantine. Licinius was deposed and kept his life. However, Constantine changed his mind a year later and put him and his son to death. Now, master of the entire empire, Constantine decided to found a new capital in the east. Rome was no longer the political center of the Roman world. Controlling the junction between the Mediterranean and the Black Sea, and positioned between the west and the eastern world, the new Rome, the city of Constantine, was founded on the site of the Greek city of Byzantium. Constantinople was born. The emperor raised many buildings there, such as the Grand Palace and the first version of Hagia Sophia. The city was inaugurated on May the 11th, 330. Constantinople quickly turned into a Christian metropolis. 
inside the climate of tolerance towards Christianity. Constantine discovered the way in which Christians constantly came into direct conflict between themselves when speaking about theology. He attempted to help them unify under one doctrine, to guarantee the religious stability of his empire. It was therefore in Nicaea in 325 that the first ecumenical council was convened. Around 300 bishops from all over the empire came to debate over various subjects, the most notable being the Arian controversy. The bishop Arius rejected the Trinity as he considered Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as being inferior to the Father. After two months of debate, this concept was finally declared heretical by the majority for which the Father and the Son are consubstantial. Arius and his allies were banned to ensure public order. This was not the end of Arianism, however, as it continued to exist for centuries inside and outside the empire. It was under the reign of Constantine that the Praetorian prefects obtained the administration of all the prefectures. In addition, in order to replace the Praetorian guard, the Magister Officiorum obtained authority over the new Scolae Palatinae, a new palace guard supposed to accompany the emperor at all times. At the head of the army were now the Magister Peditum and the Magister Equitum, and the troops of each diocese were to be commanded by a commis re militaris. Below this rank, a dux would have the authority over one or multiple provinces. The army was separated into two distinct entities, the mobile troops being able to intervene quickly were named the comitatensis. It was the extension of the tetrarchic comitatus. There were also the frontier soldiers, probably of lesser quality, called limitani or repensis. Their role was to guard the limes. Replacing the aureus of Diocletian, the solidus was produced. This gold currency was promised to a bright future. Later, another coin, the meliarensis, was also introduced. Working on legislative reforms, Constantine notably improved the life condition of slaves and strengthened the meaning of marriage, particularly by dealing very harshly with adulterous behavior. The Danube was frequently threatened and the emperor reaffirmed Roman power there with several campaigns. He had already campaigned during the 320s there against the Sarmatians and the Goths. After the construction of bridges, and new fortresses on the other side of the river, a major offensive was launched in 332, including Caesar Constantine II. The Goths were defeated and signed a Fodus, making them a subordinate of the empire. Sometimes later, the Sarmatians were beaten again. Also in the following years, a usurper appeared in Cyprus, but he was quickly dealt with and executed. The emperor was aging, and he had to think about his succession. A few years earlier, Constantine had his first son Crispus executed for some obscure reasons, which most probably involved his wife Fossa. Constantine therefore decided to name his three remaining sons Caesars, and assign them a part of the empire. The eldest, Constantine II, obtained Gaul, Spain, and Britannia. Constance received Italy, Africa, and Pannonia. Finally, Constantius II got the eastern regions. In addition to his three sons, his nephew Dalmatius was also made Caesar and obtained the Balkans, and his second nephew was named King of King of the Pontic people. Despite this, there was no longer any semblance of the tetrarchic system the Roman world was now in the hands of the Constantinian dynasty. In the east, Persia, led by Shapur II, 
attacked the recently Christianized Armenia. Constantine reacted along with his nephew Anibalianus, but the campaign was halted quickly. Now, in his 60s, Constantine felt his health diminishing. His life was about to end. So, as an ultimate will, he was baptized on May 22, 337, near Nicomedia. His body was brought back to Constantinople and buried in the Church of the Holy Apostles. In many things, Constantine continued Diocletian's legacy, but he also deviated from it in many ways. The administration and the army of the Dominate reached maturity under his rule. He retained the principle of the quasi-theocratic power, but infused Christianity in it, which he promoted widely. The Tetrarchy was finally abandoned, but the emperors, in the years to come, would continue to designate Caesars to rule with them. The capital of Constantinople would eventually polarize the Roman world between East and West. Thus, Constantine the Great, the first Christian emperor, would end up having a gigantic impact on the centuries to come. <laughs>